Good evening. My name is Jeff Herbst. I'm president of Colgate. I'd like to welcome all of you, uh, faculty, staff, students, and I know we have a number of out of town uh, visitors. Uh, welcome to this celebration of art, mathematics, architecture. I know we also have some emeritus professors, and a special welcome uh, back to you. Uh, this is really a wonderful event. I am. Um, I said to do it that I'm a little disconcerted about the drinking before uh, the, uh, the event, but uh, as uh, the Colgate people know, it's spring party weekend, uh, so I guess anything goes. And a special shout out to the students who are here uh, when lots of other students are doing something else. So uh, thank you for engaging in this uh, very serious academic conversation. Uh, universities, uh, academics are often criticized for being too siloed, uh, for delving deeply into their own discipline. Of course, that's what we're trained to do in graduate school. But uh, the public at large and so many people uh, don't understand just how profound the interdisciplinary practices are of the modern university. And certainly the title of uh, uh, the talk and symposium today says it all about abstract mathematics, vi virtual geometries, physical manifestations, and of course, art. I'm so glad uh, that uh, DeWitt Godfrey uh, and colleagues uh, thought about this project, conceptualized it. As some of you know and you'll hear, it took years to work through all the different manifestations and then brought it to a very imposing physical reality. I'm especially grateful to the Picker Institute for providing so much support along the way to DeWitt and his colleagues. I've been interested in this project for a long time. I found it fascinating, not only the design itself, but the combination of different disciplines. Uh, when DeWitt told me that the plan was to lift 13 tons of steel over a building uh, and put it in, uh, into a pl interior plaza, I thought, well, what could go wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, it provided a good amount of entertainment uh, for a couple of days, and several of us kind of sat there watching the crane take the steel over the building and all hoping that it would all work out. Um, and of course, it was assembled uh, in quick order. In fact, some of you may have seen the article, I think it was yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, about the tension that among couples that going to IKEA produces, especially in the especially in the assembly of furniture. And I thought, well, what are these people stressed out about? They're not assembling 13 tons of steel, uh, which might fall on them. Uh, but in any event, it was great to see it. Um, it was great to see it uh, put together. Especially nice to see students, former students, working on it. That's a manifestation, of course of the basic Colgate educational philosophy that faculty and students work together to produce knowledge and art. Uh, so this is really a gratifying moment. I think it's a great moment uh, for DeWitt and colleagues who have worked on this for so long. And I think it's a wonderful moment for Colgate also, not only because the school supported this project along the way, but because we're now beneficiaries of the sculpture, which I think will be staying in its current space at least for a while. I believe so. Um, we have on this campus, like many campuses, a problem of art, public art occasionally being misplaced, of students taking them, whatever. They appear in dorm rooms sometimes, but uh, no one suggested that this one's going anywhere. Uh, but anyhow, congratulations uh, to the artists, mathematicians, architects, manufacturers, students who have combined to put together this wonderful sculpture and who are going to talk to us now about its production and meaning in the symposium. And thank you all so much for joining us here today. Thank you. And now I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, uh, like Jeff, I would like to, there's lots of people to thank, uh, but certainly the picker Interdisciplinary Science Institute, uh, the President's Office, who provided an important push to uh, make this project finally uh, come to reality. Um, for the symposium, the Colgate Arts Council, and also my department, the Art of Art and Art History. Um, so, this is the credits, really. Um, uh, these are people who um, had large and small roles, but all equally important. In the production of this piece. Um, 
I'd like to especially thank uh, this couple of people, uh, Chase Jackson, who's been working with me since his junior year at Colgate, uh, Dwayne Martinez, who's our department technician and all around handyman, and of course my collaborators, uh, Eduardo and AKT Engineering, Tomo and Tom for being here. Um, but, uh, you know, when you do a project of this scale, it's, I guess it is a little bit more like architecture. I sometimes think of it as putting on a play. Um, or maybe getting ready for a rock concert that there's an entire big thing that happens, the show is up and then you never see really what goes on behind the scenes. But I wanted to have an opportunity to um, acknowledge everyone who had roles, um, sometimes just as supporters, um, cheerleaders, and, and finally to my family and uh, especially my father who um, died about midway through this project. Um, part of the reason it took us an extra year, um, the summer he was ill, we were meant to be building the sculpture, but he really would have he really would have loved this and he would have loved to have been here with all of you. Um, our invited speaker, um, Gregory Epps, will be giving the keynote here in a moment from Robofold in London. Uh, Mark Farness, an architect who will be joining us tomorrow afternoon. Tomas Pazanski, mathematician from the University of Ljubljana, um, who really, uh, in some ways, our relationship is what uh, kind of led to this uh, possibility of us um, doing a project of this scale. Tom Tucker, um, who uh, if you get a chance, uh, there's a sculpture that's a model of Tucker's group uh, that's up on the main floor of the Ho Atrium now. Um, it joins its um, partner sculpture, which is at the uh, Beaster Museum in, uh, in where in Slovenia? Beaster? Uh, yeah. Um, Eduardo Tabuzzi, the project manager for AKT2. Um, who spent, uh, worked on this project for probably a year and a half. Um, I'll be talking more tomorrow about, you know, that every project has thousands of hours of work, and this one was sitting behind a computer. In fact, after we got the pieces that were prepared, um, the assembly and installation of Odin only took us eight weeks. Uh, Dan Hamilton, uh, who I met um, at a workshop um, that was actually organized by Greg, uh, a applied mathematician of Mesh Consultants in Toronto, Elie Dufourquet, um, assistant professor here at Colgate in computer science who's doing some very interesting things with um, the space of uh, vision and computers and Chase Jackson last but not least. And my last slide before I let Greg take over is I just want to describe our, our research method. Uh, so when we began this project three years ago um, we had no idea that a sculpture like Odin was going to be the outcome. What we were really trying to do is develop ways of thinking, develop tools for exploration so that we could discover form and find form rather than simply solve a formal problem. Uh, and in this node here, we have this, the ab we decided to call the abstract, which is the mathematical. Um, we can speculate in dimensions far greater than our own. Uh, we have the geometrical objects, that is the virtual world of the computer in which everything works and sort of beautiful and free of gravity unless you create that simulation and then the actual object the sculpture of the real and as you can see the arrows go all directions we didn't imagine that we would start from one place and end up in a linear fashion or the other but we tried to think about ways of working in which uh, we could move freely between these two areas three areas of, of inquiry so it's, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Gregory Epps um, uh, the founder of Robofold. Um, he'll be showing you more about his work. He's using, interesting using robotics in the formation of architectural elements and design. Also working uh, now and creating a, a simple to use robotic software um, with his company Ro um, Ro I Robo Robots.io. Robots.io. Sorry, I, I neglected to bring your little bio up here with me. So I'm making it up. Um, Greg, was, <laughs> Greg was trained as an artist and, and later an, as an architect. Um, he's uh, legendary in the world of folding. Um, uh, and when you go to Greg's workshops, there are these giant robots and equipment and routers. And you sit down and you get little pieces of paper and you start folding them. Right? That's the first thing you do. And I think for me, the, the really exciting thing about this whole process is the way that the physical and the virtual really interacted. That is, we didn't design in the computer to make objects, we actually made objects, which we tried to replicate in the computer, which we then taught the robot how to fold, which we then redesigned, and back and forth and back and forth. And for me it was a really, um, I make things, so it was a way in which I could really understand 
how these new tools can be used. <coughs> but, Greg. Thanks to it, and thanks to everyone uh, for coming tonight. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about RoboFold and Robots.io. Um, I want to give you kind of uh, a look at the technology we've been developing. Uh, DeWitt gave you a little bit of an idea. Uh, robots are involved, so I'm going to show you that. Um, and we'll look at some of the examples, sort of types of things that we make with this technology. Um, I'd also like to give the, the technology some context. So I'm going to give you a little history of uh, CAD software and CNC machinery. It's very interesting to understand how those two evolved and how we've got the technology we have today. Um, and to take that a bit further, I'd also like to show you some of the types of things people are doing with robots today. So you see some of the work that we've been doing, but I want to show you how people are developing their own processes as well, um, and a little look at the types of processes people develop with uh, Robots.io software. Um, so there's four stages to the uh, talk. Uh, I hope that'll take you on a little journey uh, through, uh, and hopefully that will help uh, you all understand DeWitt's sculpture as well and where he's coming from with that. Okay, so let's start with the process. Uh, here's a little video, um, and exactly as DeWitt says, we start with paper. So we take pieces of paper, we fold them, uh, we score the lines with a scalpel. So we can have these nice curved lines, and we get the robot to replicate that. Okay, so the way we do that um, is really to in the middle of, in between the paper and the metal, we have software. So the software, we basically try and embed a physical process in the software, uh, which is folding, uh, so that we can create instructions for machinery um, that can replicate that process. So what we start with is paper. Uh, we start simulating it. We simulate robotics and generate code for the robot. Uh, the robot does some folding, and then we assemble something afterwards. So let's look at that in detail. Um, so with paper, it's actually a very interesting design process. Uh, that's because paper is actually um, perhaps not something intuitive uh, for us to design with in our heads. So I think everyone could sort of close their eyes and imagine a sort of blobby, amorphous shape and design something with it. But you can't do that with paper. If you decide you want to um, imagine the relationships of these different curved folds in your head, it's, it's too complex. So we've actually evolved around double curved surfaces like the human body um, and things in nature. And we can understand that implicitly, but paper is really an industrial material, so it's, it's much more, uh, it's, not, it's much newer and not something we're really capable of, of designing within our heads. But once you get it in your hands, it becomes very intuitive. So the process really is to let yourself kind of go free a bit and see what can happen with the paper. Uh, we tend to build hundreds of different pieces of, uh, sort of designs um, and start to select ones we think are appropriate rather than just egotistically imagining exactly what we want and saying to someone else, just go and make that for me. So that's typically how design has worked in the past is you can, you can imagine something and you can draw a picture of it and you can give it to someone and they'll manufacture it for you. But we try and make sure that there's a connection between all those stages and that we can actually manage all of those. So it produces a really beautiful aesthetic, um, but also we have, to, we have to understand the geometry of the surface, and we put that into our simulation software. So we use a platform, uh, a CAD platform called Rhino, and it has 
a sort of visual programming side to it called Grasshopper. So that allows us to first embed um, a sort of a flat pattern of a piece of paper that we want to fold um, and add some parameters to it, um, make the curves adjustable, make the fold angle adjustable, decide how it gets orientated on the surface in this particular example. Um, and that's quite important that we can do that simulation um, and have control over all of those parameters because if you start to design something very complex where we have thousands of unique parts, the software allows us to have many unique parts, um, but we need to manage that somehow. So here we have an example of a facade, um, and the information from here carries on forward. So the information about each piece and how it should be cut is in this, and it carries on forward in our sort of data flow and the information of how each one should be folded carries on forwards. Now, that all sounds good, but if you change something, you've suddenly got a problem that you don't want to have to update each one individually. That'd be very painful. So we make sure that the software is linked all the way through. Um, so that generates, from that 3D model, it will generate all of the cutting patterns for each piece. And we directly generate the code for the cutting machinery as well. So we're really trying to be very uh, linked in the design process. So you can understand then if I go back and change the initial uh, panel, the piece of paper that I folded, it will update the code for the machine that's going to cut it. Uh, this is the router. So we cut aluminium typically uh, in-house, or we cut stainless steel. Um, we'll have that laser cut for sort of external works. And then we do the same for the robots as well. So each panel from that uh, example you saw will be brought into the simulation individually. And we have to set up the simulation so it can handle the level of variation that there might be in the panels. So some of the panels might be wider, some might be longer. And we have to make sure the robots can reach all of those. And again, what that means then is that um, <coughs> we, might, so we might batch all those. Uh, so we can have sets of sort of small to medium, medium to large, large to extra large, for instance. But again, if we start updating small things about the original design, the robot simulation will update so that we can manufacture um, all of those pieces successfully. Um, this is the sort of control side in Grasshopper um, for the robot software. So I'm not going to talk a lot about it now because I will talk about it later. Uh, when we talk about robots IO. But you can see you have like different paths, they merge together, and then they reappear in here. So this is time based, the robot moves over time. Um, and all the colors here tell you things the robot can't do. Which the game with robots really is making sure they can actually reach everything. They're a bit like your own arm. So they have the same sort of limitations. So the game is, can we get rid of all the colors? And that means the robot will actually be able to go in, pick something up, fold it successfully, put it down again. We'll talk about that more in detail further on. Um, and then here's the robots. So as you saw in the video, they'll go down, their vacuum grippers sort of turn on, they lift up the piece, and then they fold it. And the same way we score a piece of paper with a scalpel, we'll score the metal with a router. So we cut halfway through the metal. This is covered in plastic at the moment, which is why it's white, just so it's protected. So what, what we've been able to do here is actually form metal without a mold. So typically with metal forming, you need a very large uh, male and female mold. So you put your sheet of metal in between and you hit it with a few hundred tons of pressure and it will form it. And that's how you make uh, parts of cars and things like that. Um, but each mold is, if you want to make just a one prototype, you might need to spend a few thousand pounds on a mold. You could make it from wood, perhaps. It doesn't need to last very long. But if you want to make tens or hundreds, you've got to make it from much harder materials, maybe some aluminium. And if you want to make a car where you're making tens of thousands, you need to make that from a solid block of steel, which uh, will need machining for looks like, at least a month of non-stop CNC machining <coughs> until you've created this mold. And that's a lot of money. But it's fine, because you're making hundreds of thousands of the same panel. So it goes down to like maybe it's a pound per piece. It doesn't really matter anymore.
But in a scenario like this where every single panel needs to be different, you can see that would be completely impossible. So we're actually, at the same time that architects and designers and artists are demanding that we're able to build the types of designs that they're suggesting, we're also providing technology which then enables them to design those um, buildings or artifacts that have variation in them. So each of these kind of leaves uh, was then installed in this piece. Um, there's about 300 different leaves in this. We also had all these little branches laser cut and they all hang on cables in this shopping center. So the ones we were prototyping there were all aluminium. These ones are all stainless steel. So instead of the router scoring a line, we're perforating a line, so sort of dashed line. And basically we're just removing enough material that there's a weakness so we can fold the material. So I'll show you a few of our projects. So these we've been working with uh, artists, designers, and architects. Um, just trying to make you know, high quality pieces of work. Um, but each time there is that link from the beginning where we have a design right through to all the production data at the end. So in this case, there's 400 boxes. Each one is unique. Um, so we actually built a model of this entire piece, and the design rationale was that it should reflect different parts of the um, atrium where it's situated. So we had tools where the client could pick different parts of the building, and they would, you'd get some lines that would reflect and sort of design this for them. But as they did that, we always had that link to the unfolded pattern of the box and the CNC code for the router, so that. Um, we didn't have to then process each one of these and say, okay, I'm going to go and cut it now. So it's extra work up front to do that, but it does mean that if someone changes their mind, which they invariably do, then there isn't, we don't have to start from scratch with the work. Um, we've also started to kind of zoom in on the, um, on the material. So this is slightly thicker. This is three mil material, uh, a little table. So we're actually treating the material like a solid block of metal and machining it like a solid block, but even though it's only three mil, just to get that level of detail in there. Because this is a piece that most closely uh, relates to the Witt's work in that there's a huge amount of tension in this piece. So it's folded just down the middle here and then around the edges here but this is held, two people need to hold this in while it's fixed at the top, so there's a lot of tension in there. So it wasn't possible to do this one with robots. We don't do everything with robots. Um, the robots would have enough force, but they wouldn't have enough uh, grip from their suckers to actually hold it. Uh, this is a piece that I designed, which is uh, <coughs> just a bowl, a small fruit bowl. But really this was to express what's possible with uh, sheet material in terms of the types of form that you can achieve. So this was designed just by crumpling pieces of paper and then refining those crumples and extracting the smooth kind of, uh, parts of those crumples that I want to recreate. So it's kind of artificial crumpling in a way. This is another large artwork we did. This is for Zaha Hadid Architects. This was at the Venice Biennale in 2012. So at the time, this was the largest work we had done. Um, there were 488 unique panels. Um, so we really had to put into practice this kind of data flow idea. That, um, but in this case, the architect was doing the design digitally. So we did this sort of small scale iteration where we helped them find a type of panel that could be folded by us and that could be integrated in the design by them. So we did many iterations of that. We did one-to-one -one testing of that, uh, building panels at one-to-one -one before they really got their digital model uh, refined. And then that digital model would actually generate, it would unfold the panels 
and animate the panels so that we could then uh, use those animations to drive the robots directly. So what that meant is, again, we had all this upfront work, but we built it up to about here, and then the architects changed their mind <laughs> and said, we don't, like the, we don't like the top, can you change it a bit? So we were able to kind of phone back to the UK and say, look, just remake the top bits to this new design. Um, and for them to generate that <coughs> extra data was negligible in terms of work at that point in the project, whereas typically that would be the worst time to get a change and you'd have to really start from scratch and manually update all those things. Um, but it's a, really, yeah, it's a really nice project to work on, um, a really beautiful result. Um, and you can see yeah, a lot of bolts to put in there. Um, so it was built in about two weeks, uh, in 10 days even. It's quite a short uh, time frame to build it. Um, and it basically consists of sheets of 1.5 mil aluminium. And where the bolts are, there's two layers. So it's really not a lot of material, six meters high. Uh, it's sort of maximum where the overhangs are, it's 11 meters long. So it's built to be completely self-supporting so it's a compressive structure, uh, but it actually has a little split in the middle. So at some points, it's, there's some tension in there as well. So quite complex to engineer. OK, so um, you, you've seen the RoboFold process. And um, you've seen how we kind of chain together our design into um, simulations which generate production data. Uh, and you've seen some of the projects we do with that. And I wanted to give you some context of where this really came from. And I mean, I was very much involved in um, using the CAD software that we were using, but I didn't quite realize why the CAD software existed. And so I started to look into it. I discovered some really interesting uh, facts. So I'll share those with you. So this gives some context to the word digital fabrication. So um, from the outset, CAD, like computer-aided design, uh, which is the software which will simulate three-dimensional objects in your computer and allow you to draw them um, in 3D, was really there as a means to generate information to directly manufacture from the CAD model. So it was never intended as a drawing tool. It's intended as a manufacturing tool. So, in 1942, the first uh, CNC machine was developed. So that's computer numerically controlled machine. They took a normal three-axis machine, and this is the computer bit. They were quite big in those days, uh, and it tells it what to do. We're using punch cards. <coughs> it will tell one axis to turn a wheel. They put a motor on it, and it moves something across while it gets cut by the spinning. Uh, sort of drill bit. Um, and this came out of the Air Force, uh, so collaboration between MIT and the Air Force uh, started in 1942 and sort of finished in 1949. Um, and then not long after that, in 1959, the CAD project started at MIT. So it's literally called CAD from, from the word go. Um, but the really interesting thing is here in the preface to the paper that they published, the long-term goal is automatic manufacture once the human computer design team has established the features of a design. So this is really critical in our understanding. So we have this CAD software because it was intended to actually work with machinery. So it was never a drawing tool. It was never there to document sort of orthographic projections. It was there to actually model what we were going to manufacture and in modeling it generate the code for the machine. And this is the first uh, CAD model that GM used in 1962, which is the <coughs> hood of a car. And that little thing generates G-code. Like you saw in our uh, one of the images I showed of the G-code we generate for mm -hmm. our router, exactly the same. Just tells it where to move in space in X, Y, and Z. Uh, what tells the machine where to move, which is cutting something. Um, 
So very much nowadays we just expect that we're using it to document something that will be made by someone else who'll do that manually. But from the start, this was intended to be a relationship between you, the computer, and the machine. Something that made a big difference to CAD was Ivor Sutherland's Sketchpad, which uh, he started in 1961, um, which is basically um, a user interface. Here he's designing a piece of furniture. Uh, he's using a light pen in the same way we might use a touch screen. Um, he invented object-oriented programming for the even audience who know about that. It's quite important. Um, this is a completely parametric design tool. So that means that um, you, and it's associative, so that means you can associate different um, measurements with each other. So one of the things you might do is say, I want to associate the diameter of the leg with the width of the chair. So if I have a very wide chair, it needs to be stronger, so I'll have a wider leg. And you can make those uh, associated with each other. Um, if you're designing furniture, like these tables, um, you might have two pieces, and you associate the size of one um, and the size of a slot in another so that you know that it's always minus like half a millimeter less so it will slot in just right. So those sorts of associations can be built up. But this was, I mean, pretty all-encompassing piece of work. And if you look at any CAD software today, it really is uh, in debt to this. Uh, and here's a kind of typical, typical example of the type of thing you can do. So there's a diagrid in the background, and the two shapes that have been arrayed on it are this one here, so it makes hexagons, and this one here, and it makes a sort of fish scales. So if you associate some of those dimensions as well, you could change out different parts, you could change the dimension of the grid in the background, and things will update. So you can see the importance of this idea of things being linked together. Uh, so let's fast forward a little bit to where we're at now. And this is the sort of thing that your average uh, architecture student will be able to do on day one in their, in their studies with uh, Grasshopper and Rhino, the tools we've been using. Um, it's the kind of the dream of easy design has been realized in that there are tools that will allow you to generate these things very quickly. Um, and then you can print it, so that's great. So it's job done. Um, but <laughs> Although we want things to become easier, um, what we don't want is to lose the intelligence of the craft person and the sophistication of the material. And in a way, you could argue that that is happening with 3D printing, that despite the fact that it sort of democratizes uh, creation, uh, in doing so, it, will, it does to some extent mean that you don't have to ever have had your hands on a piece of material and really understand it. So there are many, many processes um, that a craftsperson uh, or a fabricator uh, or a manufacturer needs to know in order to create something. And what this is saying is you don't need to know that anymore. Um, but at the same time, there are interesting possibilities in this. I mean, this, this is targeted at, uh, at this level uh, at people who maybe don't know all those processes. Um, but we're investigating 3D printing because we think there are ways in which it can be used in interesting ways, and I'll show you some of those later as well. Um, but the, the bit that does all the work on this, so this is like that big CNC machine we looked at before. It's a three-axis machine. It can move X and Y and Z. Uh, but the bit that does the work is just a little bit on the end that's extruding. So you're spending like almost $3,000, but really the bit that does the work is just less than $100. It squirts out plastic. Okay. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, and here we have another machine, another positioning device. This is the robot. So it's the same as the CNC machine. Um, it requires some code, which you get from CAD, in order to move. Um, and essentially it does whatever, um, according to whatever the tool is on the end of it, that's what it does. Okay. So with the 3D printer there, it was the nozzle on the end instead of a cutting tool. And with a robot, there are a lot of different things. So in a car factory, there might be welding, might be gluing. Um, but here's a list. 
There's lots of things it can do. It can, uh, we can do some extrusion like 3D printing uh, or metal deposition. We can do folding, bending. We can move things so we can assemble and stack and weave. We can subtract so we can use cutting tools to do milling and sawing and drilling. Uh, we can put sensors on it as well so that robot can then um, have force feedback. So if it's pushing too hard, it can push a little less hard so it doesn't break something. Uh, and you can use vision systems to see where objects are to pick them up. Um, and you can do welding and gluing. And you can do a lot of things. And actually, this is a very small list of things. Um, this is pretty much what's been done consistently with robots for the last um, 20 or 30 years. Um, I mean, since they, were, since they were first invented in the 70s, they were really used to sort of pick and place moving things around, but then they started getting used for other things. But what's exciting is that that's just the <coughs> beginning. If we think about this idea of craft and the types of processes that we all, that someone does in a workshop, um, the robot is so like us in that it's just an arm. It's very similar. And if you start to add sensors so it can see things and feel things, it starts to become very like us. And so we don't have to lose that craft. We can start to embed that craft in the robot. So I want to show you a few projects that take that a, um, a bit further, that idea of craft in the robot. Um, just some projects of work I find interesting out in the field of architecture. Uh, it's, call it state of the art, it's uh, academic research. So it's kind of free of the burdens of uh, being too realistic, but at the same time, um, they are trying to make uh, advances in the field. So this is a really interesting book. I'd recommend everyone buys it, The Robotic Touch. It's by um, Gramazio and Kohler. They're at the ETH in Zurich. Um, and they're looking at quite <coughs> pragmatic uses of robots for construction. Um, they're well known for their projects building walls with robots. So taking the idea of the robot in architecture quite literally and using it to build walls. Um, but this is designed as a surface. Uh, the surface links to the definition of the brick stacking. The brick stacking links to the description of the movement of the robot in space. So again, the same idea of this data flow. And if they update that surface, everything else will update as well. Um, that's what they're most well known for. But there's some of their more interesting research recently that's been doing things like this project here, which is actually 3D printing a sort of space frame. So then that allows <coughs> them to infill the space frame with concrete. Um, so they pour it in from the top and sort of shake it out, and it comes out the sides a bit. If they get the consistency just right, so there's many iterations there. Um, then they can have a free-form surface uh, from concrete without a mold. So quite a nice idea. Uh, another nice project they've been doing is this truss system with wood. So the robot will pick up a standard length of wood and put it into a circular saw to cut the ends at a particular angle. And then it will pass it under a glue gun and stack it up here and put a few nails through it. Um, so it does all of those things unattended, again, directly from the CAD model. And their idea is to make this roof. Uh, so sort of free-form roof. But they're really testing it. So <coughs> this is it's going to work, and they're going to build the roof with it. So it's not sort of theoretical test. It's a very practical test um, to, make, to make sure that they can actually transfer those ideas coming out of academia into practice and really set a precedent for um, what you can do with robotic construction. This is quite interesting. Um, a complete different approach. So rather than the work at uh, the ETH in Zurich, which is um, quite um, well controlled. This is kind of the other end of the spectrum. 
this is uh, Cyarch in Los Angeles. Uh, they have five robots, and they do sort of crazy things with them. So that is the general idea, is to do crazy things with them. Uh, this is nothing to do with construction, I don't think, but what they're trying to do here um, is much more related to the movie business, where it's about the impact of uh, something much more ephemeral, in this case, light. Um, this is quite interesting as a technique. They're taking a TV monitor and drawing a 2D line, and while uh, they take a single picture of that and then move over a little bit and change that 2D line, and keep moving it and taking pictures, and that's built up of many, many slices, and they overlay all of those slices to make something that looks three-dimensional. Um, and they put some mirrors on the end of robots and reflected lasers. And they made some really weird blobby things. <laughs> so there really isn't, uh, in a way, you can see how different that is. There isn't, isn't really any reason why they should make this. Um, who knows why they wanted to make it. But it's a different approach to design. So you could start with something you think might work. Uh, hypothesize that you're going to build this uh, roof system, um, develop it, and develop the techniques required. Or you could start with something very, very weird and strange with no real purpose to it. Um, but let that <coughs> suggest ways in which you might develop um, something tangible with structure and permanence that comes out of that that could be practical in architecture. So they're different approaches. One is Swiss and one is from LA. So they, they kind of got their <laughs> different ways of doing things. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about Robots.io. So what Robots.io came out of Robofold um, <coughs> after spending, uh, well, Robofold has been a long project. Um, it's been running for about 18 years. That's half, half my life. Um, which started with paper folding. And I, had, I scaled it up to metal. And I needed something to do the folding for me and discovered robots. So the last seven years uh, since I set up Robofold has been developing the software to do all this control of the robots. And along the way, people have said, well, can, can you help us with our process as well? And obviously, we've had a lot of experience developing a very complex process. Um, we've been through the pain of developing robotic software and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Um, and um, it seemed worthwhile enough that we should kind of split off Robofold and Robots.io um, and really try and provide a tool that other people can use to develop their processes. We tried to get all of the sort of difficult things that we had experienced uh, in developing these processes uh, and turn them into a piece of software that would be a lot easier um, for someone who hasn't been trained in robotics, for instance, uh, to actually get those processes and embed them in the software so that they can get on with designing uh, rather than understanding the machinery and getting the machinery to work. So this is an example of the sort of interface we have. So again, we have the grasshopper and rhino. So, but this has now become much more simplified. Uh, so what we have here now, these are uh, working tools rather than working prototypes of tools. So uh, one of the things that um, DeWitt was doing in the Odin project was trying to build tools, because the tools are very important. They allow you to do the manufacturing side of it. They allow you to connect design to the manufacturer. Um, and we've, we've done that in a few particular cases for particular processes. Um, and the two things that allow that one is this timeline that we saw. Um, so if you press play, um, this little green ticker moves across here. And you can actually tell where you are in the path of the robot and control that and um, know whether your production is possible. And the other thing we've done is to create an API, which is an application programming interface, which basically means you can build your own uh, functions uh, directly into our software. 
So we expose the sort of core of our software and allow you to build your own um, simple kind of layer on top of it. Um, there's a lot of complex code going into this part of it, but as a user, you don't really want to read the code. You just want to be clicking a few buttons. So we do a lot of work in the background to make these into practical tools. So in a way, we've kind of gone beyond this sort of doing this uh, state of the art work uh, and actually now compress that down to something that's so small that it's almost not there. So it's just a few little things to do to get that uh, huge amount of function out of the, of the robot. So this is one of the things we did for milling. Uh, we got this little robot, very cute. Uh, and we set it up, we developed this sort of simulation uh, software. So you can, from this, you should be able to understand uh, everything that goes on in the process of <laughs> robotics. And really, seriously, like, okay, so the tool is plugged into the robot, and the robot is plugged into, plugged into the timeline, which is doing all the movement. And we have a mesh, which is a, a type of surface in, in, the, in the CAD software, which tells, um, which needs some surfacing doing to it, and that also goes into the timeline, and then it generates some code for the robot. Okay, I'm just going to skip back uh, to, where is it? So, yeah, okay, there's a picture again. So, at the end of it, we upload, we, simultaneously we're looking at that simulation, so we know if it's going to work or not. Uh, we can view all of the, of the cutting of this part. Um, and then afterwards, we can send the code out to the robot and do it for real. But it really, as I said, we've been through this process a lot of times, and not having a simulation is uh, makes things very difficult. So it's really important to have that simulation. Okay, so back to here. So I think you can kind of understand how that process works now. So we tried to get something that, at, at one point, we would have had probably over a thousand different components and here we have like five or six different components. Because what we've done is we've created um, this special plugin which has all that function built into it. So what that means for other people is they can make their own special functions and not have to develop a piece of robotic software first, just concentrate on what they're interested in. So here's a quick video which should play of how that works. So you can define a few parameters, like what size tool you have, and things like that. Then you just need to select the part that you want to cut, and click, and then it's generated the tool parts. Uh, Grasshopper users might note that this special button doesn't exist because we made it specially, so you only have to click once instead of twice, which seems a bit extreme, but we've just really, really trying to make this simple for people who have never used this software before, um, manufacturers who are going to invest in this to save them money and make their life easier, one click less is important. Um, and this would have a tool, so you'd actually, you can see the sort of box that would have started off here, that would be a solid block of foam, typically, or maybe wood, and you're just subtracting that away. This is quite a simple operation, so normally you have to remove more material first in a roughing operation, and then... Uh, surfacing operation, but for this example it's quick. It's just nice to see that you can switch from one piece to the next piece. With minimal effort you can start making the next piece. So the RoboFold process was uh, a very big process with a lot of, uh, kind of, a lot of stages to it um, and was quite when we first started doing it, it was very, very difficult to, to manage. So in a way, we've built all this software to just make our lives easier. Um, and hopefully it makes other people's lives easier as well. Um, so in this example, the final example here, um, you can see that idea of everything being linked again. So here we're actually modifying the design that we want to make. So it's already got all the tool paths on it. Uh, but if we modify it, you'll automatically update those tool paths. So again, behind that, then it updates the code, and then you can 
upload it to a robot and make a different shape piece. And that's typically the workflow for someone who's designing something or designing a process. There's many, many small iterations. And the more iterations you can do, the closer you get to something that works properly. And then you can commit that and say, okay, now we're going to manufacture this many of them. Or we know that, okay, if I lift this up too far, I can't reach so that we can understand the design limitations uh, within the manufacturing constraints. <coughs> And this is the result. So you can see all these layers in the background here. So first we do the roughing operation to get rid of as much material as possible. And then we're just smoothing after that. And there's all sorts of funny things in the background that the software is doing, like dealing with undercuts, things that the, the, the tool can't reach. Uh, it will do that without you knowing. So we're just trying to make a lot of these things happen in the background so that you can just get on with designing something and know that it's manufacturable. Um, at the moment we're adding these rotary tables so the part can move while it's being cut and linear rails as well so that the robot can reach, like if you have a 10 meter rail, you can, in this case, polish a boat that's 10 meters long. Yeah. Um, so these, the, the work we're doing now has become less about um, these experimental processes, but more about making robust industrial tools that, will, that we can actually sell to manufacturers and they're not going to break. So um, we have <coughs> experienced industrial computer scientists doing the work, so uh, it hasn't broken so far. Um, this is another interesting project at Cranfield University. This is wire arc additive manufacture. So additive manufacture is the correct term for 3D printing, let's say. Um, and wire arc is uh, welding, basically. So here they have an interesting setup. They have two different streams of uh, weld material coming in, so they can actually tune the alloy that they're going to print. Um, and then they can 3D print with it. Great. This is titanium. They do steel, aluminium. Um, so this is a wing spar. Um, they have a lot of aerospace partners. Um, and you can see in the same way that you would do with sort of plastic 3D printing, you can build up these 3D forms. So this is when I start to like 3D printing, because I think it's really interesting that you can actually not just make a plastic part that is um, a visualization of something you might make for real. This is making it for real. And what they typically do is machine back the surface after they've printed it, so you get a smooth surface. So what that means is so that wing spar would have started off as a block of aluminium, and they would have removed 90% of it, and that's waste. In this case, um, they use 10% of that, uh, <coughs> and then they're removing, I don't know, maybe... 10% of that on top of it, just to shave off the final surface. So you, it's really very efficient. Um, so what we did for them was just build this tool so that they could import a shape, slice it, generate the tool paths, and simulate the printing process. Um, and we should have a little video of that. Well, that's a simulation process. So this is running at sort of 10 times the speed because 3D printing is pretty slow. But it's quite impo important for them to actually visualize the process. So in the same way we're visualizing folding in our simulation, visualize the printing, uh, we visualize the, you know, all the robot movement for the milling. So it's quite an important aspect. Now we can see just what we built for them in Grasshopper was just the ability to change a few parameters. This is a plugin, so it uses our, the API, so they can change the weld parameters. 
And eventually what will happen then is we'll close, at the moment that's open, we can adjust all the code, but we'll close that and encrypt it, and then they'll be able to then sell that uh, as a complete system where they have the software and the hardware um, which can be plugged into our software and then they can, uh, anyone can go and do some 3D printing in metal. So we also built sort of mini RoboFold factory. So this is in the Robots IO section, although it's RoboFold, but really it's part of Robots IO because we're doing robotic hardware integration and the software aspect of it. Um, so we built this sort of little factory. So that's about sort of two and a half meters high, two and a half meters wide, some little robots in there. So the other ones we saw, um, each robot is kind of higher than this in our normal factory. So what this enables uh, someone to do is to do a small prototype. And it's quite nice to do prototypes on a small scale. So we do folding by hand, and they can do robotics at a small scale as well before handing over to a larger robot to do the real production. It just means it's much less intimidating. Uh, in this case, it's in the university, an academic environment, and the big robots are dangerous. These are enclosed and they're pretty safe. So they can do the same thing they would do at uh, half scale uh, before scaling it up. Um, and this is the sort of thing we have to do to set up the robots, is like just make sure they're extremely well calibrated. So these little spikes uh, touch lots of different parts of the space they're in and tell us exactly where the robot is. Um, and from that, we put together a 3D print system. <coughs> uh, so you can do the same thing, print a uh, small scale with a robot. Um, and one of the things we're doing with that is putting carbon fiber filament through the robot. So if we start to weave these sort of um, diagrids, you can actually tune uh, how you build so you can actually print these in space in 3D. So we're not doing layers and layers and layers. We're printing in really in three dimensions um, so that you can tune the properties of the material according to the layup of the carbon fiber. So these are really interesting. So we really look at trying to find what uh, are genuinely commercial applications for these technologies because uh, that's necessary for us to do that. OK, so I'll summarize the IO plugin. Um, and so I, can, I hope you had a chance to see how we have, uh, we're able to embed this experiential knowledge of physical processes uh, into a computational framework that respects this design and development journey, so these many iterations. Um, and in a way, none of the processes are, uh, processes are ever finished. You have to keep um, iterating in the same way that software is, is never really finished as well. Um, and we're just constantly iterating and learning. Um, and really we want um, these tools to enable people to develop more processes. Uh, I think that's what uh, DeWitt's journey with uh, the Odin sculpture is about as well. Is like, how do we get to a point where these tools become practical? Uh, I think, I mean, we discussed over dinner, like how long would it take to make another sculpture? And it clearly wouldn't take as long because all of the knowledge, all the know-how gets embedded in the tools. Um, and you know that you could then recreate those. So when we focus on these specific areas with the tools we're developing, we know that there's enough people out there who want to use those tools many, many times so it makes it commercially viable. So when I started this, it was very much about just developing the technology. Uh, RoboFold has been an amazing kind of journey developing technology, but now we have to really look at how we can help other people develop uh, viable commercial technologies. Um, and I think you can see there that there are a lot of, I mean, we've been focusing on, on relatively well-known technologies, and in the state-of-the-art examples, they're some of them quite abstract or less-known technologies, but they are um, really about the things that we do by hand, 
the craft and the technique and the know-how and how we can embed that in a piece of software. So we're not taking away from the craftsperson, uh, just augmenting their capability. So I think that there is a discussion to be had on whether uh, we are completely replacing people. If we keep putting all these processes into, into machinery, um, but in fact, there's a lot of new processes, let's say not new processes, a lot of old processes be, that have not been done for many, many years, craft processes that have been lost, that people are looking up old processes because they know they can put them into a robot. You can't put them into a three-axis machine that just moves like this, but a robot is, just does exactly what I'm doing now. It can do all those movements. And if you start to add sensors, um, you can start to get to a point where we're very close to uh, replicating humans. Yeah, we'll leave it on that. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking of you as 18 years of paper folding. You must be one of the world's great experts in paper folding. And Quite so, possibly. So I'm, so, <laughs> so I'm wondering about that. I, when we hear about big pharmacy companies. One of the things you think pharmacy companies make drugs, <coughs> but one of the things they really make is huge databases of every possible chemical you could ever possibly mm -hmm. imagine that might act as a drug, a drug that they can then test. Have you created a taxonomy of paper folding? Like, do you have a great catalog of paper folding? That um, is yeah, we have a basic taxonomy of the different fold uh, types, but not the combinations. So that's maybe, like every time we teach a workshop, uh, there'll be I don't know, like a couple of hundred combinations of all these different types of folds, all made from the basic same building blocks. And there's about um, 12 different sort of distinct types that we could identify, let's say. There's no great catalog. Uh, no, no, there, there needs to be. One of the reasons we're doing uh, a lot more work on the robotic side and less work on the folding side uh, is because actually we need very clever piece of software that knows all those possible fold types so that when you design them, it then automatically knows how to manufacture them for you. I mean, that's at the moment, you know, we have a way of, of manufacturing things, but the dream really is to have that level of control over it where it's, it's automated enough that if you're sitting at home designing something on your computer, that it, that it can run that simulation and test if it's manufacturable and give you advice on, okay, well, you know, if you make it a little bit different, then uh, it'll be manufacturable. I have uh, friends doing this, kind of what you've suggested, and what I just talked about for minimal surface sort of fabric structures, and they have catalogs of every fabric structure that's been made in the last 25 years, and all the fixtures and fittings for it, so they can know that for a particular environment, then there's these five examples that were used, and these are fixtures, and these are suppliers for it, so that level of, of uh, control when you start to bring the data in, it's really interesting. Yes? Why would a manufacturer be interested in replicating um, the activities of a robot to create these products that kind of come down a, an assembly line as opposed to asking you or, or maybe buying the robot for the purpose of making a mold? They do that too. Um, so, what's the the question really like? The question is: Is it is it really worthwhile for them to buy into your software and the, and the robot um, to to you know create piece after piece that gets you know let's say they have their manufacturer basically instead of just making one thing out of it, which is a mold and then making another mold maybe for some other product that they have. Yeah, it and then just using those molds to be able to do it very quickly without going through the process uh, every single time. Yeah, it depends on the volume. So below a thousand parts, uh, it just gets expensive to invest in tooling. Uh, that's kind of the cutoff point, really. But we can go down to one part. I mean, it would be expensive to do one part because you would have to do all the development. So there's some point the graphs cross and we have uh, it's efficient to do that development work so that we don't have to pay for tooling for the prototype right? yeah. yeah but then in our case the prototype 
uh, is exactly the same as the production piece, so same material. Um, and the actual production takes about 30 seconds. Uh, maybe you can add a bit more on either end to pick the piece up and put it down, but it's the same as pressing, it's exactly the same speed as mass production pressing. So it's not uh, an issue about it being slower doing it this way. Uh, and even with the press part, you still got to design it. And in our case, you have to design it and you have to do some simulation of the forming process. And you also have to prove out the tool as well. So you need kind of the real experts to come in and look at that tool and say like, why is my material not flowing into the mold at, at the correct speed? So you have to put some baffles in at the edge to slow it down. And it may not, it may stretch too much in certain places. So you have to change the design even after the fact. So it's not that you know, the pressing is foolproof. It still requires high levels of skill. And I think it's more um, reasonable to expect us to embed those levels of skill in the robofold process, where it's more connected to the software, than in the pressing process where you have that disconnect, which is we use the software to design the mold, and then we put the sheet into the mold. So um, you can, uh, yeah, I th you can get different shapes from the two of them, but I think ultimately, uh, you know, they're not. The mold process is not completely infallible. It just requires it requires huge levels of skill to make it work. You showed a lot of, I'm really fascinated by the RoboFold uh, equipment, and you showed a lot of examples of metal folding. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, that you, you're also able to kind of run uh, different kinds of composite uh, sheet materials or wood even through this, or, or is it pretty much strictly for metal? Yeah, composites will generally, uh, they're designed, composites are designed to be very stiff. The composite yeah. layers are there specifically for that, so it doesn't, really work in that same way um, so plywood would crack or something yeah, crazy, yeah. Um, if you made a sort of sharp fold line in ply it would crack along it but things like um, die bond or aluka bond you can do straight folding but again it's very stiff so it doesn't do uh, curve folding because it needs the material to curve as well as the fold curve uh, you can do other materials so plastics you can do so you can heat the fold line uh, or you can create a living hinge uh, by machining it in plastic. Um, you could probably do glass as well. Um, so, but yeah, plastics work quite nicely. Yeah. Do you find that along the fold parts, because you were describing how you have to route like halfway mm -hmm. through, um, depending on the material where the fold is going to be, is that structurally weaker than it would be if yes. you were to press it? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So one of the workarounds we have there is to then re-weld that fold line. Okay. Um, so overall, you end up with still less work than if um, if you had to invest in the tooling. Right. And so you for different do models. the welding by robot. Yeah, you can well. also do the welding with a robot. So the, the biggest cost to welding is actually positioning the part. It takes the longest, that's the hardest thing to do. So the parts are mm. still stuck together because they're right. one part. So and have a head start back. Yes. So in um, for straight folding pieces, uh, if all the if all the the fold lines are straight, there's a continuous motion from flat to the folded position. But with a curved fold, there at least the theory says that there's no continuous motion between the flat <coughs> and the curved. Um, at least one without uh, distorting the material that you're folding. How do your robots deal with that? Um, kinda? Well, it depends what fold it is. So if you have uh, just one fold, then that's fine. <coughs> if you have like um, three folds in a row, the fold in the middle, um, mm. so the three folds would be like four surfaces, so you've got this and this, mm -hmm. okay? But one of these ones, these faces in the middle, is then uh, constrained by the ones around it. Um, and in that case, you do get in the simulation, because your uh, surface rulings don't move in the simulation, it can only technically exist in the flat and the folded state. But in reality, when you're folding, those rulings can move a little bit. 
So we don't model that explicitly, but as we're folding with the robot, it deals with it fine because mm -hmm. the, the rulings just move slightly. Mm -hmm. So the rulings for everyone are basically the surfaces are generally cones or cylinders. So if you bend something, you can actually put a straight line on it. Uh, and if I do that, I can still put a straight line on it, and they're hence called rulings. Um, so yeah, we just allow the real world material to accommodate that. Ultimately, we'd like to simulate that. So. Yes? Yeah, at various points, you seem to use some you know, traditional terms, our craft design. Uh, and yet, the, what you described here seems to me to blur the lines among those, you know, normal uh, processes. Can you yeah. comment on that? I mean, it's a simply a matter of use. You showed, you know, you showed what you described as a piece of art, and then your bowl, which mm -hmm. I really love, by the way. The bowl's uh, what, what distinguishes? Simply a matter of use, that the one has a purpose and the other does not? Um, maybe they're all art. I don't know. That's kind of what got me into it in the first place. Like, whatever you do with a piece of paper, if you put some curved folds, it looks beautiful. And it's also manufacturable. So those two things, for me, were a killer combination. And even at uh, 17 or 18, I just thought, well, this, this is great. Like, this works. Uh, this could be really valuable for people, because I didn't have lots of money at that age to buy tooling. I wanted to make bits of metal, um, but I wanted them to look beautiful. So it's kind of, it's their art, but they're also uh, craft. You know, they look, requires a lot of skill to make those things. Um, their design, if they have some uh, utility as well. So there are lots of things. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. In, in terms of the list of projects we saw there, I think maybe that gives you an answer. Well, please join me in thanking Greg again.